We come here to Mark chapter number 8 and we find the record of the healing of the blind man. This is the final miracle. One commentator called it the, the final signature of Jesus. It's the final miracle in Galilee for sure. And we know not in the ministry of Jesus, but the record of the gospel of Mark. It's the last miracle that Mark mentions in his gospel. It's six months before the cross. Jesus is trying to move from his public ministry with the people to his private ministry with his disciples. The final part of the gospel of Mark is that finale where it's going to be his passion for the world as he suffers and bleeds and dies and uh, he's raised from the dead and ascends to the Father. And, and here at this part of Mark, uh, Jesus is trying to spend some time with his disciples. The watershed moment, the great continental divide of this gospel is right here in Mark chapter 8. It's Peter's declaration that thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Until then, only demons declared that and saw that for who, who Jesus was clearly. Demons said, you are the Christ. Now, Peter figures it out and he says, hey, you are the Savior, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Mark chapter 8 contains one of only two miracles found only in this gospel. And both miracles are a little bit unusual. Both of them involve Jesus spitting. Now, we would think that was disgusting, but here in the text, there's a point and purpose to that as Jesus spits on this man. Now, Jesus heals people and works with people in different ways. I'm thankful there's not just one way or one method or we, he is the way, but how he reaches people, how he heals people is, is distinct. Vance Havner said, you know, the first time we see Jesus just uh, one touch, he touched the blind man, he's healed. We're going to see here where there's two touches and then uh, there's a third one where there's mud in the eye as he spits in the mud and he puts it in the eye. He said if churches were have that today, they would get all divided about that and say, we're the one touch church. Uh, we're the two touch church. We're the mud in the eye church. I don't know if we're in the mud in the eye church, but you know, God works with people in different ways. He reaches us and there's not one, one method uh, of reaching somebody for Jesus Christ, but the gospel remains and the savior is the same. His name is Jesus Christ. This is the only two stage miracle. Every other miracle was instantaneous. You look at what he does in the different ways and how he reaches out. This is the only time that it's in two stages. Here Jesus returns to Galilee. He's been in Decapolis, that Gentile region. We, we know that he fed the 4,000 Gentiles. And then he returns to the place nearby where he fed 5,000 plus Jews. Many of those that were here in this area of Bethsaida uh, were possibly those who had eaten of the miraculous loaves and fishes many months ago. He's four miles from Capernaum, the, the place where three, possibly four disciples claimed as their hometown, uh, Peter and Philip and Andrew and possibly Nathaniel. Bethesda means the house of fishing. And this was a fishing village. It was on the northeastern shore of Galilee, a, a small village with, with some people that were there. But there are six times where Jesus heals those who are blind. And here by this small fishing village, he takes this one outside the village and heals him a different way. It's a completely different way of healing somebody. If you found your place in Mark chapter 8, let's look at the word of God. Let's hear God's word. If you're able, let's stand together for the reading of God's word. With that context, look at verse number 22. And he, Jesus, cometh to Bethsaida. And they bring, now notice the present tense here. They, they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. And he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught or anything. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up and he was restored and saw every man clearly. And he sent him away to his house saying, neither go into the town nor tell it to any in the town. I want to draw your attention to verse 25. And he put his hands again upon his eyes. I want to preach for a few moments about the second touch. 
the second touch. Thank you for standing and may be seated. I'm told the greatest selling artist of all time, more than Michelangelo, is a man by the name of Thomas Kincaid. I love Thomas Kincaid's uh, paintings. He was the painter of light. I believe we've got a couple examples of it, like the second one especially. It just makes me want to go take a hike somewhere in the mountains. But, you know, he, even more than Michelangelo, Thomas Kincaid was one in 20 households have some sort of painting of Thomas Kincaid. And he loved his paintings. He put them out. They were in place. He sold them. And he had a policy that if you bring one of his paintings to him and pay a little more money, He'll touch it for a second time. With his own hand, he'll personalize a, a special part of that, that painting. I wonder if he could just put me right in there. That'd be wonderful. But you see, it's personal and it adds value. This morning, if the picture of your life isn't what you know it should be, if you don't sense and understand the value that God has for you, let me tell you, the greatest artist of all, God himself, if you bring your life to him, he'll touch you a second time. Amen. I think about another illustration. There's an organ company. I know nothing about organs, so if I mess this up, please let me know. But I'm told there's a certain organ called the second touch organ. It's by the theater that makes all the warm to tones. And if you depress the first time, if you depress one eighth of an inch, you'll make a sound. But if you, if you touch it again, the second time, all the registers of the organ will rumble and shake the house. There's more music. There's a fullness and depth on the second touch. Maybe somebody is here this morning and, and uh, you're not really understanding the fullness and the depth of your salvation. You can go to God and he'll give you that second touch. The second touch. I think that's what the Lord is communicating partly here in Mark chapter number 8 that we need a second touch. In fact, there are three touches that the Lord Jesus gives to this man. Not just the two touches of the miracle, but he'll take him by the hand. That's touch one. He'll take him out of the city and he'll, he'll spit into the eyes and hold him. And that's touch two. And then he'll ask him, where and what do you see? And when he admits where he's at and what he needs, the Lord touches him a third time. So we need a second touch. We need a third touch. I don't know about you, but I like that song, you know, there really ought to be a sign upon my heart. Don't judge me net. There's an unfinished part, but God is perfect according to his plan. He's the master, whatever. I'm the clay. I, he's still working on me, right? Amen. I need the second and third and fourth touch of the Lord. And it's, it's a miracle that God works in our life. There's a lesson. There's, a, there's an invitation here in the text. It seems on the surface, and some liberal scholars have come to this passage, and they, they say that Jesus miscalculated the miracle because he felt it necessary to touch the second time. This is the Lord Jesus who has touched someone who was dead, and he's risen from the dead. Jesus didn't miscalculate the miracle. Others say that he didn't have enough faith, and so he needed to have more faith to get the second touch. No, there's no mention of this man's faith. This, this man is being used as an object lesson. Jesus has made it very clear, his omnipotence. He has made it very clear that he can touch, and with a word, and there will be instant healing. Every other miracle was instantaneous. He touched and healed the leper. He healed Peter's mother-in-law with the fever. He touched the dead boy of the widow of Nain, and he came to life again. He touched the ear of Malchus's servant. He was healed. He healed instantaneously with a touch. He healed instantaneously with a word. Not just did he heal with the touch, but anybody who touched him was healed instantaneously. Think about that woman that crawled her way through the crowd and reached out and touched the hem of the garment and she, with her testimony, inspired the multitudes to copy what she did and everywhere Jesus went, people would throng to him just to get a touch of Jesus' garment to be healed because he was the one prophesied in Malachi who would come with healing in his wings or tassels. They knew it. The fulfilled prophecy of the Messiah. So why a second touch for this man? Let's walk through the text this morning because I believe there's great application. There's an interpretation of the text. One interpretation, many applications. So we walk through the text this morning. Notice the preparation for his healing. Verse 22, when he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him and besought him to touch him. Now, keep in mind, Mark is someone where he, I like Mark. He's, he's a little ADHD. He's like me. He just kind of 
gets focused on the present. But if anybody would have recorded this miracle, it wouldn't it have been Mark? Mark was an instantaneous person, immediately, straightway. Here, Mark has to kind of take a step back and say, there's one miracle, this last one, this final signature, where it wasn't instantaneous. It wasn't straightway. So a man who's in the present tense has to put pause on the present to focus on the next. He said, there are those, and he painted the picture of the story. It's Peter... Remember Mark, he was the one, John Mark, who was unprofitable first in the ministry for Paul. And, and Paul sends him away and there's that contention so sharp between him and Barnabas encourages him. And Peter mentors him in Babylon uh, in ministry. And now he returns and Paul says he is profitable. Send Mark unto me. That man is profitable. So Mark is the one who is writing this, moved by the Spirit of God to write this. Peter most likely is the one giving that testimony. So he's writing what Peter saw. And this all is going to connect with preceding and proceeding context. So he comes to Bethsaida, they bring a blind man unto him, and they beg him, they besought him to touch him. Here's a man who's blind, and some friends and family perhaps cared about him enough to bring him to Jesus. There's a lesson for us today. We need to recognize that those who are blind can only get their sight and their salvation if we bring them to Jesus. First, Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4 says, The God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. We've been going out on Friday nights to this time, about 1 o'clock in the morning, and going up to Moore Square, and it has been incredible. And sometimes we have some opposition. Sometimes there's an open door. Sometimes there's a hardness. There's always a need of those that are homeless and need to be fed and have water, but everybody needs the gospel. Everybody needs to be saved and uh, there's there's a need and there are many that we talk to and you know one of the nicest guys I talked to was actually a man that had the uh, Satanist logo on his jacket and he had a, uh, a curse word against Christians on his on his back of his, his coat and but he was very kind you know he most people would have pushed him away and not paid attention to him but uh, he was very kind but it's very clear uh, that as I talked to him that he was hurting from something that happened in the past and it was very clear that he was blinded by whatever happened to him but most importantly blinded Blinded by the devil. He said, if they're so, if God is so good, then why are all these bad things happening? The bad things aren't happening because of God. The bad things are happening because of that guy on your jacket named the devil who was out to steal, 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 kill, and destroy. And God is not someone who forces us to believe or behave a certain way. God invites us. God involves us. Uh, and there's a choice made. And it's not God's fault that bad things happen. It's, it's the enemy, the, the devil, who is out to steal, kill, and destroy. And it's sin that's the struggle. And so he was so blinded as he's worshiping the one who is causing the problems. And I realized as I stood there, I couldn't argue, can't debate against someone like that. You can only really pray and... Ask God through the faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God to go to Jesus. The gospel of Jesus Christ brings light. He's the one. The God of this world has blinded the minds of those that don't believe. We need the gospel of Jesus Christ. This blind man had to be brought to Jesus. The blind man had to be willing to trust someone to lead him. He could have pushed away. He could have stopped it. But he followed these that said, there's someone who can help you. And so he takes the steps needed for his, his salvation. And he goes to the, the one who alone can save him. You see, in that day, there were no cures for blindness. There were, these who were blind were outcast in society. The only treatment for blindness that they would give, according to one source, was they would take rooster blood, mix it with honey, and smear it on the eyes. So if you think that, that spit was bad... I, it's a lot better than rooster blood and honey on the eyes. In fact, probably he had that on his eyes, caked with blood, caked with honey. And when Jesus spit on him, he was cleaning him off. I think that's part of it. They were untouchables. Pharisees wouldn't touch him. Sadducees, separatists didn't want to touch them. Rabbis didn't touch him. But they know there's one who would touch them, the one that touched the leper. There is one who would not leave this, this one alone. And so they begged him. They besought Jesus to touch him. The word there is to pray. There's action in prayer. When's the last time you called somebody's name out in salvation? And when's the last time you did something about it? When's the last time you brought that one to Jesus? You can't save them. You can't heal them, but Jesus can. Amen. All of our responsibility is to bring them to Jesus. To bring them to the one who can help. We notice the compassion of these soul winners. They bought, besought him. They entreat him. They beg him to touch him. But they went a little further. They, they direct Jesus how to heal this man. We don't, we don't tell God what to do. 
He's the doctor. We're the patients. And they say, touch him. Jesus says, all right. But that's not how I'm going to heal him. In fact, he's not even going to heal him in front of them. He takes Jesus, touches him. Now notice, in order to take, notice what the Bible says. He took him by the hand. He took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. Do you see the, the beauty of this, the simplicity? Jesus touches the man. He's not healed at that point. The Lord just helps him out of the town. Can you imagine Jesus walking through this town with a blind man? With his love, with his compassion, bringing him to a place of, of private ministry and help. Here's a man that nobody would ever touch him before. Nobody would ever look at him. But Jesus, in his love, took a sightless, begging man by the arm and led him out of the city. This man's not healed, but he's in the presence of Jesus. Hey, maybe you're here today and you're struggling with something. Just get into the presence of Jesus. Get to his word. You may not have the, the full healing or the full help that you need just yet, but wait. Let him lead you by the hand. Let him walk you to the place. Let him get you to the point where he'll touch you and then touch you again and again until our final, uh, our final uh, resting place is up in heaven. Listen, salvation in the life of sanctification and the life until the glorification of Christ is simply being led by the hand of Jesus and receiving his touches on a daily basis. What a beautiful picture of what the Lord does to this blind man. He touches him and this man is not healed. But he takes him by the hand, patiently, kindly, leads him to the place of healing. Notice now the process of his healing. Look at the two stages. Verse 23, and he took the blind man by the hand and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on his eyes and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught or anything. He led him out of town and spit on his eyes. We've said before that most likely his eyes were diseased. They were matted shut. They were crusted over. Jesus spits on his eyes. Now, spitting in that day in that culture was a sign of healing and help. I think he was communicating that this saliva, what he was going to do. This man couldn't see Jesus, but he could feel Jesus. He could understand what was happening. And as that spit touched his eyes, he heard it. As he heard Jesus, he knew that Jesus was going to heal him. I'm, I'm thankful today when people come for prayer and healing, we don't spit on them, you know. Uh, I like the oil a little bit better than the spitting, but uh, you know, this, this, the, they come to Jesus and he spits in his eyes and then he says, as he touches him, do you, do you see anything? It's, a, it's the first time where Jesus questions and he says, hey, did it work? Now the man could have said, yeah, I'm doing all right. I got it. I see a little bit here. Thank you, Jesus, and be satisfied with that, but he doesn't stop. He's honest about his condition. God just wants us to be open and honest. If you're struggling with a sin this morning, if you're caught in the blindness of some sort of sin, you just go to Jesus. The Bible says, he that confesses and forsakes it shall have mercy. But those that cover their sin will not prosper. If you need the help and healing that Jesus alone can bring, you just go to Jesus and be open and honest before him. He knows you. He knows your frame. He knows your name. He knows everything about you. You're not going to surprise him. Just be open and honest with him and others. Confess your faults one to another that you may be healed, the Bible says says. Just, just be open before him whom the eyes of the world cannot be surprised. The scripture speaks about he knows it all. He spits in his eyes and this man looks up and he says I see but I, see, I see men. Now this tells us that most likely he could see before he was blinded. Because how would he know what men looked like? How would he know what trees looked like? He said I, I see men as trees walking. Now I'll just be transparent. This is this is where I would be without my contacts. If I didn't have contacts today, I couldn't see your face in the front row. Uh, I, I, I'm looking forward to someday getting that LASIK surgery or something like that because I need these things, especially those that I backpack. I leave them in. That's probably not a good idea. But anybody else nearsighted? Without your glasses, I'm thankful for the, the glasses and the corrective lenses. But this time, in this phase, you would have been considered, without your glasses, blind. With rooster blood on you and honey smeared in your face. And so he says, with somewhat 
bad vision. Now, I was thankful, none of my really, like, wow, Kaylee's the only one that has glasses, but I got six kids. None of them got my bad eyes yet. They got Candace's good eyes. Joey went in to the doctor for his physical, and uh, they said he had, like, better than good vision, like 2015, whatever. And I'm like, yes, that's great. So no excuses for him at Wilson Christian when he says he can't see. But, uh, you know, <laughs> he can see very well. <laughs> and uh, this, man, this man can see, but he can't see super clearly. He says, I see, I see men... I've seen, I know this. For years, I didn't, I got glasses in second grade, and I didn't want to, you know, look like a nerd, so I did not wear the glasses. I would take them in, and I would put them in my pocket to school, and they would inevitably break at lunchtime and recess, and I would, the only way I could see was to do this. And I couldn't see the board, I would, do, I would kind of just do this all the time. I remember when I first got contacts in the seventh grade, I begged for contact. I never wore, not a day in my life did I wear glasses. The only time I wore glasses was for a picture in the second grade. And that was just about blonde. Took the picture, took it off, put it in my pocket, and my parents would find out. But, uh, they would see the picture. But the day I got contacts, wow. I was like, I can see. You know what I'm talking about here? You know, I was like, I can see the trees. I can see people. I, so I, I, I kind of, a, I understand what this man's feeling and facing here. He says, I can see a little bit, but, you know, not clearly yet. I don't have full focus. He's healed, but things were still out of focus. Maybe that's you this morning. You're saved, but there's some things that are still not fully focused in your life. And you need a second touch. You know you're saved. You know you've come to Christ for salvation. You know he's touched you, but there's some areas that, that you still need to grow in. It's a tremendous picture of the Christian life. Verse 25, and he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw the word. The verbs here, there's, there's nine different verbs here. All of them in the nouns, all of them have to do with all the words for sight. They're all here in this text. This man could not see now he can see, he saw every man clearly. So preacher, what's the purpose of this healing? What's the purpose? Look at the previous context. Verse 14, the disciples go on the boat. They don't have any bread. And Jesus says, hey, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Legalism will trip you up. But don't just mess up. Don't get messed up with legalism. Beware of the leaven of the Herodians. The licentiousness will trip you up. You just caught, get caught up in Jesus and see Jesus and trust Jesus. And, and they're listening to Lord Jesus' message saying, don't get the leaven of the Pharisees. Don't get the leaven of the Herodians. And they're like, is he mad? Because we didn't bring bread. They're still caught up in the physical. They don't see fully the picture. And Jesus said, hey, do you remember when I fed 5,000, how many baskets were left? 12. When I fed 4,000, how many baskets? Baskets were left seven. He said, how do you not? You have eyes, notice, you have eyes, but you do not see. How is it, verse 18, that you have eyes and see not and ears that hear not and do not remember? How is it, verse 21, that you do not understand? You see, to the disciples, things were still out of focus. They saw Jesus like a big oak tree walking. They saw Jesus, but they saw him as a king. They saw him as somebody who was coming to rule and to reign, but they didn't see Jesus for who he really was the one who would suffer, bleed, and die on the cross of Calvary. Oh, he would be on the tree. He would be like a tree, but he wouldn't be walking on the tree. He would be dying on the tree. It was foggy. That's is why he does this. This is why the Lord performs this miracle. He does a partial healing to let them know they don't see fully the full picture. Peter figures it out. The next context, Peter is there and he said, who do men say that I am? Well, you're Jeremiah, you're one of the prophets, you're Elijah brought back from the dead. And he says, whom do you say that, whom do you say that I am? Peter gets up and he goes, I see clearly thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Amen. Jesus didn't come to rule and to reign. He came to redeem man's soul. So let me ask you this morning, what do you see when it comes to Jesus? Do you see him simply as a genie in a bottle when things go bad? You just call out in prayer and get the help and healing that you need? Or do you see Jesus as the one who came, suffered, bled, and died, took your place on the cross of Calvary, suffered for you, died for you. Think of the worst thing you've ever done. The purpose for Christ's coming was to die for that sin, to die for you, to take your place. He was buried and rose again. Do you see Jesus for whom he is? He's not just some story. He's not just a good man. He's the God man. He's not just a prophet. He's the perfect prophet, priest, and king. He's my king. He's my savior. He's my Lord. Do you see Jesus for who he is today? 
Or you get caught up in the, the traps of religion, the leaven of the Pharisees. Do you get caught up in the traps of the world, the leaven of the licentiousness and worldliness? It's time for you to get your eyes on Jesus and see him who, who he is. The one who loves you. The one who died for you. The one who's coming again. Amen. I talked to that man that was there that night and I, he said, everything bad's going on. And there's no God stepping in. I said, what if he came back tonight because he could? Would that change your perception? He goes, yeah, but he isn't. I said, well, he says he's coming quickly. And he's coming to set everything in order. You see, here's the, the interpretation of the text. Sight comes from received light. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 9, that he lighteth every man that cometh into the world. But it was many as received him. When you see fully from the light of creation and conviction and conscience... When you see fully who Jesus is and fully who you are, to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. You can receive the light of creation, conviction, and conscience, but when you come to the Lord Jesus Christ as a personal Savior, is he your personal Savior? You have to see yourself as a blind sinner in need of a Savior. And you can say with John Newton, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found was what? Blind. Mind, but now I see. John the Baptist tried to figure it out. John the Baptist was in prison, locked up and locked down for what he said and what he was preaching in repentance. And John the Baptist says, I don't know what's going on here. I hear that Jesus is feeding people. I hear that he's providing meals in Galilee and providing meals up in the Gentile region. Is he really the Messiah or is he the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world? So the disciples go to Jesus and say, who are you? John is wondering. And Jesus answered, tell John that the blind receive their sight. Why did Jesus tell John to know that the blind receive his sight? Because nobody cared for the blind. There was no purpose in healing the blind. The purpose of healing the blind was to prove from Psalm 146 that he was God. And that blindness was a spiritual blindness. And that blindness was a condition that Isaiah prophesied about the people that were hardened and blinded. And the one that came, that great light that would come, Jesus Christ, would come to bring us sight and salvation. And John knew at that moment that he was right. He was the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He wasn't just going to be a king. He was going to be a savior. See, the second touch speaks of inner healing as well as outer healing. He could see there was sight, but there needed to be focus, a brain set in focus. Jesus always ministered on two levels. He healed on the outside and he healed on the inside. And after salvation, here's some applications today. After salvation, after we clearly see who Jesus is, God wants to give us a second touch. I think about those in Acts, in Acts chapter 2, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And what did they do? They went out and they praised the Lord supernaturally. When Acts chapter 4, they needed a second filling of the Holy Ghost. And this time, they didn't just praise the Lord, they preached the Lord and spoke the word of God with boldness. Hey, listen today, one baptism at salvation, multiple fillings after salvations. You need a second touch. You need a third touch. You need a fourth touch until the Lord returns. I think about David. David was anointed three times. He says in Psalm 90, I believe he talks about how he shall be anointed. The first time he was anointed, he was touched in his calling. The second time he was anointed, he was touched in his confirmation. The third time he was anointed. He was touched in final consecration. In between touches, the Lord had a purpose and a plan for a little shepherd boy to make him into a king. He had some trials and troubles in his life for him to see clearly. Hey, maybe this morning you're in between touches. Maybe you're going through something and things aren't super clear about what's happening and what's going on in your life. You just stay in the presence of Jesus. You just be open and honest about where you're at and what you see. You just listen to his word and his voice and let him touch you again. Yeah. Ask him to touch you again. And we need a second touch. I'm thankful today. The Bible says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it under the day of Jesus Christ. Salvation is not the end, it's the start. It gets us on the journey of the destination. And every day with Jesus is just the Lord taking us, to, uh, taking Jesus by the hand, taking us out of the cursed world and bringing us to a place where he can touch us and touch us again and again until he comes. What a tr this is the final signature of Jesus in a miracle. Why is this story on record? Well, to show the disciples that they needed to see Jesus clearly. To show us 
that it's salvation, it's spirit filling, it's the second touches and continuous touches by the Lord Jesus Christ here on earth. But also is to encourage, is to encourage those who are doing a work for the Lord. And it seems like you failed. It seems like things aren't clear. If things didn't turn out the way you expected, just go to the Lord and ask for a second touch. Amen. Don't be satisfied with not seeing things clearly. Don't, don't be satisfied. Don't go to God's word and say, well, I don't really super understand this. You pray for it. Ask for the illumination that comes from the spirit of God. Amen. You dig down deep in his word. Don't, don't wait and say, well, I'm just, I'm here. I think about that man. The, the Lord could have said, okay, I, I healed you. You can sort of see. You know, see, Jesus didn't just come to bring us life. He came to bring us life more abundantly. Amen. He didn't just come to do a little bit of work in you. He came to do a full work in you and to not give up. Just go to the Lord. Don't, don't just sit around and be complacent and, and, and just say, I know it's blurry. I know things are out of focus and I'll just kind of deal with it and move on. I know I've got this addiction. I know I've got this struggle, but I'm just kind of live with it and kind of go through it in different areas. Go to the Lord for a second touch and a third touch. Get the help and healing you need to have the full anointing and victory that Jesus prophesied. It proclaims and he promises in his word. I don't know what your struggle is this morning, but don't be satisfied with seeing and feeling things that are still not clear. Don't be satisfied where you're at. Go to the Lord for a second touch. I think about the examples in scripture. I think about Elijah. Elijah has seen God move. He saw fire fall from heaven. Elijah then hears that someone wants to take his life. And he gets depressed. He gets discouraged. He goes down under the juniper tree and he says, I don't want to live anymore. I don't want to stay here anymore. The Lord doesn't look at him and say, what a baby. Oh, what's wrong with you? And get up and get going. The Bible says that the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, arise and eat. And when Elijah was there calling out to the Lord, God provided for him exactly what, did he, what he needed in the second touch. I think about Peter. Peter denied the Lord. He had betrayed the Lord. He had, he had told, uh, he said he did not know him. Three times he denied him. And now the Lord comes back and he gives him a second time and a second touch to do something for the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you go to the God? Would you ask for the second touch? Finally, there's a problem with the healing. Jesus tells this man not to share. You see the song we just sang, Ask the Blind Man, He Saw It All. In fact, Jesus told him not to share. Why? Because he was in Bethsaida, a place that saw the full revelation of who Jesus was. Bethsaida, Matthew eleven twenty one, 21, was under a curse. Woe unto thee, Bethsaida, for the mighty works. Bethsaida had seen who Jesus was, and he turned, they turned away from the sight, turned away from the presence, and the blind man was told outside the city, you're healed, this is for you, this is for the disciples. But these have rejected Jesus Christ. Hey, don't think you can come this morning and know who Jesus is and have the full revelation of who God is and who your sin is and harden your heart and push against the Lord. My Bible tells me that his spirit will not always strive with man. Don't get the full revelation of who God is and know who God is and harden your heart as in the days of provocation. Today is the day of salvation. I think about those, many of them that hate God and end up as God deniers and agnostics and atheists and evolutionists and really anti-God are those that are raised in church and knew the truth, knew God's word, knew the condition of their sin and their situation. And they go out and become all sorts of wicked, sort of mindless creatures that are given over to a reprobate mind. Yes. If you're here this morning, you know the truth of God's word, respond to it. Yes. Take a look outside and see creation. Know there's a God, respond to that. Yes. Know when God speaks to you about your sin that you're a sinner in need of salvation, respond to it. If you're here this morning, you know who God is and what God's done. Don't reject the truth. Receive the truth. Yes. To as many as received him, to them give you power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Jesus says, it's better for Sodom and Gomorrah than Bethsaida and Capernaum because they saw who Jesus was and they rejected him. Don't reject Jesus this morning. Amen. Don't go to hell from church row. If you're here this morning and you're hearing the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, God loves you. Jesus died for you. He's provided a way for you through his shed blood. Yes. Receive that gift. Receive that light today. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. If you're here today as a Christian and things aren't in full focus, understand that there's a Lord who wants you to have a second touch. I think about the Lord Jesus and the the creativity of his creation. The Bible says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. Think about his creation. 
told that a horse can only see straight ahead. They can get a little distracted. The, head, the eyes are on both sides, but yet that's why they put the blinders on there. But a horse focuses on what's there in front of them. A dragonfly is different. It has compound eyes, so it can see many things, and even in slow motion as it goes and zaps another insect. A pigeon can see a range of human sight that even a computerized, digitized program cannot even detect the colors that a, pig, a pigeon can see. Cats, I love cats, cannot see anything except in grades of shades of gray. But they've got great depth perception. When they leap, they land. A snake, I hate snakes, cannot see. Unless you try to sneak up to a snake, you're not going to do anything any good for yourself. They can't see, but they've got a capacity to sense heat and they know what to strike at. A hummingbird can see the, the UV light off of the spectrum and see things that we can't even see. But a kingfisher bird, got a picture of it. It's you and me. A kingfisher bird on top of the water has one type of vision. But when it dives into the water, it's got a different kind of vision. Two types of vision. Someone said, everything in nature illustrates something in grace. And maybe God just made the kingfisher bird to remind us that we need to have physical sight and spiritual sight. Amen. Maybe God made the kingfisher bird to let us know that there are times that we can see one way, there are times the Lord wants us to see a different way in a different situation. And we need a second touch from the creative power of God Almighty to touch us for us to see clearly. And whether you're on top of the water and everything's going good or down deep, you need the creative, you need God and his creation to help you see. And as you are in alignment with the word of God and the will of God, you can see clearly. Just go to him, ask for the second touch. Go to him and pray, open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Do you need a second touch this morning? Maybe you need a first touch in salvation. Maybe you've never been saved. Maybe you need a, a touch from the Lord Jesus Christ to save you. And after you're saved, he's still working on you. You need a second touch. You need a third touch until you get into his presence as fully restored. Whatever your touch is this morning, here's the Lord Jesus Christ. He loves you and he'll lead you. He'll lead you to a place where it's just you and Jesus. Just go to Jesus yourself and ask for that second touch.